Hi everybody, Mark Huggle here. Welcome to Academy Live and today we're doing a bit of a, a kind of a lockdown uh, special with our model and we're looking at the clock and compass live as it were. So if you're used to the way that I teach, uh, we talk about um, the camera position is at one place on the clock where we refer to as the six o'clock position. Uh, the model or the client sub uh, subject or product is in the middle of the dial and then basically the light is going to actually move around it and that's really what we want to kind of demonstrate for you today is how to get the best images quickly so that even before you arrive at a location or you begin to set your studio up you know instantly the ingredients how you're going to take a better image so we're using uh, today um, a, a harder light source a small little reflector dish you can go and watch the full versions of these kind of films on the academy uh, anyway, okay, uh, there's some special offers running to actually join the Academy anyway, so please come over and join us where obviously it's advert free and everything else as well. It's only £59 for the year, so please come over and join us. Anyway, uh, today uh, we're running a hard light, and a hard light is really good to train yourself with when you're looking at the clock and compass and position of light within your kind of studio or your uh, product or your, sub, your subject photography, whatever you're doing. Uh, because a hard light will actually create a quicker shadow and a more dense shadow. So as soon as you take the photograph, you're going to see exactly where that light is positioned. When you're using a softer light source, like a soft box or a beauty dish with a scrim on, or whatever it would be, um, you see the diffusion of the light and you also see how the diffusion feathers and kind of begins to wrap around onto the shadow side of the face. So even though a softbox is great for photography, uh, why? Because obviously it gives us an average, a little bit more kind of softer, a bigger wrap to the shadow area. In a teaching mode, it's kind of not as exact because you, you basically uh, get a little bit confused about actually where the shadows are. So in this case today, it said I'm using a um, small little reflector dish to, to, to control the lighting. Light, lighting today, we're only using technically one light in the demonstration, okay, uh, which is obviously our key light here. Now, a key light, uh, the main light is what we refer to the number one light. So in other words, unless we use that in the photograph, basically things are not gonna be ready to sell or they're not gonna look at their best. There are a few exceptions to that rule and I'll show you how a separation light instantly then becomes a new uh, uh, key, key light as such really, when we kind of go through the clock and compass with it. I've got some strip boxes running at the 11 o'clock and at the 2 o'clock position. Okay, so, you know, between the uh, 2 and the 1 and between the uh, 11 and the 10 kind of thing. So, if I'm in the middle, we've got Kelsey here, as I said, she's going to come in in the middle for us. Uh, but basically, when we're photographing, uh, the main light source is the one that's going to travel. That's what we're going to see and that's what we refer to the clock. The closer the light is to the 6 o'clock position, the flatter and the more average the light, okay? When you're a fatter per person like I am, I need more flattering light. So in other words, I need light that is off the six o'clock plane and it's closer to the four o'clock position from camera position, or it's gonna be closer to the eight o'clock position, all right? There is also a, a kind of a saying about 45 degree lighting. And so if you imagine the six o'clock and the three o'clock position here, of course, yes, 45 degrees would be kind of in the, in the middle. So if you think in the clock between the four and the five o'clock position, that gives you a 45, okay? So that's just uh, dissecting the 90 degrees fully. So if you're kind of trying to think that's where the light needs to go, then that's gonna be the right place. Okay, I'll try and make it as simple as I can in the shortest amount of time that we can. If you've got any questions, get them onto the actual Facebook, uh, sorry, onto the, uh, new, uh, the YouTube Live with us, and we'll kind of do those towards the end anyway. Kelsey, do you want to come on through, please, Dar uh, darling? Okay, so uh, we chose a red background today. <laughs> Guess why? Because uh, she looks amazing in red, all right? Um, it, it, she does look amazing in red with it. We've never photographed this before and I couldn't wait. And I've, I've been a good boy because we've been photographing all day for the Academy. And I promise you, we're going to shoot some with this next week when we're back again uh, to actually do some more kind of photography as it were. Right, let's uh, kind of just do our quick test shot. I'm going to show you all three of the lights that are going on in position in a minute. Now, I said this is about one light photography, all right? 
which it's going to be, I promise you. But at this stage, I want to show you the difference and what we're trying to achieve as far as usually we're not working with one light, okay? We're going to need some form of separation light, something, you can see this camera rocking, it's that high up there. Um, but we want some form of uh, lighting that is going to be consistent the whole time and separation light tends to actually be that anyway. Okay, so um, let's look now at just the one light. So we're, there's, we're going to take all confusion out, even though we're seeing these strip boxes uh, uh, are illuminated, they're basically not a part of the uh, working equa equation at all. So, okay, let's just do the shot first, first of all, and we can see what the one light is doing. You can see what I was on about now to do with the depth of the shadow uh, when we're using the reflector dish. Um, and by using um, a kind of reflector dish, again, we can see instantly where the problems are going to be or where the light is going to fall and so on. The first thing we need to do, though, is address the animation of the body. If I'm a man, I'm going to turn the uh, um, body towards the light source. If I was photographing a woman, I'm going to turn the body away from the light source, just a slight. And the reason that we do that is to increase the three-dimensional shadow on the bust. So, uh, Kelsey, you're going to come up to me just a little bit first, please, darling. That's perfect. Now you're going to turn the feet just around towards there, put all the weight on the back foot for me, and we're pretty much ready to go. Now, as a rule of thumb, we would be obviously not photographing cropped-wise through the kind of the top of the tummy or kind of cropping off the hands and everything else with it and things are okay. What we'd be doing is making sure that the whole animation of the body is going to be kind of sellable. Uh, but we're just using the images in front of us for demonstration of where the lighting position is going to go. So where the light is now, I'm not sure how easy it is to show on screen, but technically we're nearing the kind of the eight o'clock position, which is, as I said, my preferred look. However, when we turn the face towards the camera position, so we've naturally turned the head towards the light source. Kels, turn the head towards me, please. Uh, turn it so the nose is directly, go with the chin a touch there, that's good. So now we're going to see um, a couple of things. So if we just go to the screen for a minute, uh, what we're looking at is a 45 degree kind of shadowing coming here. There's a little bit of a nick of light going onto the eye. And if this little triangle of light was a smaller light source, okay, uh, basically we'd have pretty much a perfect Rembrandt kind of lighting. Um, and the, Rem the Rembrandt is obviously a painterly light effect from the artist who used to always kind of paint the shadow eye with just a little nick of triangle of light, white light or white paint, and actually put a, a color and a highlight into that second eye as well. And that's pretty much what I, I kind of love and most por portrait photographers use as a kind of a go-to. However, to soften that shadow down, if we just turn the head to here a little bit, there you go, darling. Um, we've naturally brought a little bit more illumination to the light. So we're gonna talk about the clock, so we may as well start at the basics, which is obviously the kind of the six o'clock position. And all I've got to do is um, make sure that the stand pretty much doesn't move its distance between the, su uh, the subject and itself. If it uh, moves too far away or gets closer to the, sub uh, the subject, of course, the problem with that, of course, we're going to increase or decrease the expo exposure. The closer the light source gets to her, we're going to increase the exposure naturally. The further we move the light back, we're going to decrease the exposure, so it's going to either look lighter or brighter. We don't want to change the working um, apertures for that. Okay, Kel, so we're straight on. So, um, because we're in the kind of the six o'clock position, I can pretty much come straight on there. Straight at me. That's great. So, this is flat light. Now, this is really great when you look like Kelsey. <laughs> All right, or we're doing headshots or something like that with it. All right, when you look like me, you need a thinner light source. Do not forget that. All right, if you're if you're ever asked to photograph me, please, I don't want to look as fat as I am in real life. Um, so what we've got here is is a complementary light when we're doing a kind of a beauty style of photography. You'll often see a lot of photographers who are shoot a shooting fashion or a beauty style of shot where they're using the light above a camera position or near, near it to create a very, very similar effect. If this light was coming from around the lens, of course, still a six o'clock position, but that would be called a ring flash uh, because obviously it's coming from around the lens itself. In this case, this is a six o'clock high. It is creating a good drop shadow below the chin. 
And obviously what we're really trying to make sure in the height of the light, that basically uh, the light is high enough to add a catch light. If we look at the eye, it's gonna be usually at the top of the color and it will be kind of following the circumference uh, around as we move it from the left to the right position or around the clock, all right? So again, we're usually looking for like, in this case, we'll be looking for a 12 o'clock catch light within the eye uh, to actually give us the kind of look. So there's our simple kind of six o'clock position. Then we slightly move it to the left, which will then create our, our seven o'clock, okay? Now, so in the same way again, by the way, you really can't take a bad photograph of kerosene ever, ever, which is a bit frustrating. Um, now we've got that seven o'clock, okay? Let's keep the face looking straight at me a minute, please, Kels. Let's let me turn the head a little bit. There you go. So that is the, the head pretty much straight on. Uh, there's always a slight little tilt of the face as a normal, where you're kind of trying to put a client a little bit more relaxed. As a rule of thumb, with all the weight on the back foot, and with basically the body turned away from the light source, the head naturally turns back towards the light source when you ask them to do it, I mean, oh yeah? So that means it's actually beginning to tilt to the high shoulder. shoulder, shoulder. In that case, it's always gonna be the front one. Uh, why? Because obviously all the weight is on the back, they're twisting the body around, so naturally this shoulder is gonna be higher. All you've gotta watch then is the crease lines along the neck that you're kind of can, you can create without even realizing it. Back to the lighting. So as we said, this is our seven o'clock position. By turning the head back to it, then we've at least got some shadow. Now, let's move this to the eight o'clock. Um, I do like to use a light on a trolley kind of uh, stand. Uh, you can buy little accessories that are the wheels to go on the bottom of your stands as well. So you can turn a, a normal stand into a trolley stand especially because we're using a wood floor, makes it nice and easy to walk, uh, uh, to push around the place. Obviously, if you're using a, car a carpeted floor, that's gonna be a lot more difficult, and I wouldn't use uh, uh, wheels then, but make sure you've got a wide enough and a strong enough light stand at any stage. Right, we're into the eight o'clock position. So this is pretty much where we began. Uh, no straight to me first, please, Kelsey. A little bit more around to here, darling. That's good just there. Oh, would help if I made a shot. There we go, let's wait for it to come live. Okay, so we're back to where we began, but we already know if we need to kind of bring a little bit more illumination to the shadow side of the face, all we've got to do is actually turn the head just around towards the light source a little bit more. That's beautiful, darling. Um, but remember, a soft box would have naturally filled in that shadow side of the face. If I wanted to, I could have also used a reflector panel to bounce some of the light back but I much prefer to use a controllable light, light source rather than just go straight into a reflector panel because that bounces light all over the place. We can't meter it, we can't control it, even though it's big and diffuse and so on. And you've also got to watch how close you put a reflector on the opposite side of the face. Now, um, there are some photographers who want to use kind of two light source, source sources, almost one on each side. The negative will be on that is that you'll have a double catch light and the lighting will look unreal. Remember, we live in, uh, on a planet with one sun, at least at pre present, <laughs> and we've got one direction to the light, we have one catch light in the eye, and that's what we're used to. So as soon as you add a secondary light source in, not only will it flatten and fatten the face, but it'll also create the secondary catch light, which will look a bit strange to actually look at. You might not be able to put your, fin or your finger on what is wrong. So again, we can see already, but if this was a softbox and not a, uh, a reflector grid, we would basically have some of the detail on the shadow side of the face. Okay, let's go now working more towards the dramatic position of the light. So we've moved it to the nine o'clock position. Um, the most dramatic use of light is from nine o'clock in a clockwise direction to the three o'clock. So every place we put a light now between nine and three will dynamic, dynamically change our photograph, uh, especially as far as kind of uh, for, por uh, for portrait photography, for product photography. I mean, if you've watched some of my kind of food photography live and kind of the, the food photography where I'm photographing with chefs on location, you'll see that basically the light is usually coming in from uh, behind position as such. 
Okay, so we got the nine o'clock. Cal, straight, straight at me with the nose first. Behave yourself. I know you want to turn your head around. Okay, so now what we're going to expect is a almost a split light condition. Uh, oh, I'll do another one, Kelsey, because you blinked. Let's do that again. She'll hate me forever for showing that live on screen. Uh, but let's get it rid of it. There we go. It's gone. So we've got a split light position. So what split light means um, is basically we've lit one side of the face and the other side of the face is too bright, okay? Why? Uh, because basically there is nothing on the shadow side because there is no light there. Even if you popped a reflector on that side, it is not going to look good. The only real way for us to kind of make this a little bit better, Kelsey, if you just look away from camera position, look just towards the uh, stand over there for me. Raise the chin a little bit more, please. Brilliant. So now we've just moved the head around and this comes back to our classic use of uh, the kind of the 45 degree light, light in. That's really what we're trying to kind of uh, look at all the time, yeah? So now that we're in the nine o'clock position of the light, but Kelsey is looking between the, uh, the kind of the seven and the eight o'clock position, as far as the head position is concerned, we're back to a 45 degree light, lighting, so we still get a good quality of light. The biggest problem we've got here, let's turn and look towards that light fully, can we? A little bit more, a little bit more. You can't do it, can you? It's almost impossible without breaking your head off the shoulders. Uh, but we'll show you how to do that now in a minute. Straight away though, that is just flat lighting. You stick me, you do the same photograph, boy! <laughs> I'm not going to be 20 stone anymore. I'm going to be 22, 23, 24 stone. I don't want to do that. So uh, again, thinking about the positioning. Profile shots, though, are better when the light comes in from the 10, 11 o'clock position. All right? So it gives us a really great look. I usually use between the 10 and the 11 o'clock myself. Uh, we'll get to there now, and that will kind of create the image. However, let's say you do want this flat light, and you do want to shoot a, pro, a profile. Not everybody's profile is brilliant, by, uh, by the way, so just don't be a, a general photographer and put them instantly into that position because you know nothing else. I mean, I've got a decent-sized nose here. <laughs> in other words, it's bigger than normal. Um, so if you stick me to the profile with it, it's def definitely going to look even bigger than it is in real life. Do I worry about it? No, I'm not. I'm an old man. I'm not too kind of concerned. You get a beautiful young thing like this behind of me, yeah, Kelsey, and if she doesn't like her nose, then basically if we, we don't realise that to begin with, then basically you're going to waste the shot, so we don't want to do that. We're not going to talk about your nose, Kelsey. I'm sure you love it and it's beautiful. Right, how do we do this shot? Um, the first thing is, can you turn yourself around fully so your back's to me? All right, now turn and look towards the light uh, fully on the left-hand side. Okay, that's great. Twist to me a little bit more, Kels. There, there you go. So once, uh, relax, darling. So now we've been able to create an easier image. But can you see what I meant about the creases in the neck? Yeah? I warned you about it. We know it was going to come because the body positioning, the angle of the head and so on. So the quick way to actually release that tension in the neck, back to your pose, uh, looking back towards the light a little bit more, twist to me a touch more. Can you lean now your head onto the right ear? There you go. Keep it, tw twist the body around to me more, 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 more. Twist the body, not the head. Lean, lean the head onto the ear for me. There you go, right. So we can soften down those lines by just leaning the head on towards the ear. I'd usually be wor working a little bit higher up. Uh, video won't allow me to do that today. So uh, again, we're working from this kind of eye, eye level. Remember the average photograph in the world today is taken from five feet two inches high. That is not a thing to live up to. You want, as if you want to be a photographer, a creative photographer, you want to be photographing from the ground or upside down or from a drone or from a, 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 a roof, as long as you're safe, of course. Um, but you want to actually get above and higher than what the average photograph is done from, okay? So remember, remember that. Okay, so um, we've shown you how to do uh, the bad shot with the nine o'clock, but nine o'clock is quite powerful. Let's show you, if you keep in that same post, me. I'm going to now move this around to the 10 o'clock position, okay? So 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock is where this light is, and 12 o'clock we're behind it. So let's do the same thing. Kelsey, if you can look to the profile again. That's gorgeous. And if we shoot the same shot, turn the head to me a little bit more. There you go. And could you just uh, lose that hair just behind on the... No, no, this side's great, other side bad. Uh, you'll see why now in a minute. Okay, so straight away... Um, on screen, you can see we've got a great shot, yeah? 
Now we've got shadow, it's not flat like it was, but if you can look close in, you can actually see just behind her, her neck or just underneath the chin, there's a little bit of the hair behind, behind her, and I call that a beard. Uh, it's not to be negative. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but pretty much, I don't know many women, <laughs> I don't know any in fact, who would want a beard, all right? So uh, again, don't give them one photographically because you've got a bit brain numb yourself. So again, we'll just move that bit of hair. I think she's done it already now. She do, you don't want a beard then, do you? No, no okay, okay, coward. Uh, all right, so let's do it again. Let me just move that, there we go. Twist the shoulders to me a touch, Kels. Look it down the chin more for me. Lower down the chin, that's beautiful. Eyes just a little bit lower as well, darling. Gorgeous shot. So that is how we would shoot, as a rule, the kind of the profile por por portrait. Um, what we don't want to do is overfill the front of the image too much and so on, because that is going to kind of create uh, a little bit kind of a mixed message, uh, especially if you're doing the likes of graduation or more dynamic. If I was photographing people who were kind of muscle toned and we're doing some more athletic kind of images. We really want that light coming in, as I said, from the nine to the three o'clock position. So uh, again, just, just from here, uh, we've got the kind of the beginnings of it. It goes without saying that uh, the next position is gonna be the 11, 11 o'clock once more. Um, now this is gonna be pretty much close to a profile unlit. So turn the head to me a touch more, darling. There you go. And look straight ahead with the eyes. Relax. Now, um, that is giving us a almost Rembrandt style of light again, um, because the light is back into that 45 degree position. Yeah, if you think about where, where it is, it's close to the 11 o'clock. Um, so it's giving us a kind of a real kind of great look. If we were photographing with the 12 o'clock position, we'll put it in there. Um, obviously in this case, we would usually put a 12 o'clock light <clears throat> we'd usually put a 12 o'clock light uh, behind the backdrop, above the backdrop, and coming back towards us. Not necessarily like we're seeing here. So, uh, Kels, we're going to still look profile. Keep it. Brilliant. So, um, we've still got the same image, but now you can see what it's doing. It's great for that kind of uh, flare or a hair shot. If that was a gridded soft box, almost a strip box, coming from above the background and coming back down, we wouldn't get all that flare, of course. It's only because of obviously the direction of the angle of light coming almost directly into the camera is kind of creating that effect. So, of course, in the same way, um, we can now think about the position that I want. So, if I was gonna photograph an ath athlete, you an athlete? <laughs> She goes to the gym more, more than me, so that makes her athlete anyway. But if I wanted to create more dynamic style of images, once we learn where the light is going to go, we can completely change what we're doing, okay? First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to switch off our one light, because technically, if I continued on putting the light on the one o'clock, the two o'clock, the three o'clock, the four o'clock, the five o'clock, and back to the six o'clock position, it's, it's a mirror of what we've just done. I don't need to waste your time with that because it's exactly the same. What we need to look at now is how and why and when would we use the light in specific places. So already uh, I kind of mentioned about the athlete, a kind of, for an athlete I want to really bring out tonality. So when we start to work with two lights, how do we work with two lights? That's the, the kind of the question we've got to ask ourselves. And do we really need to work with two lights? In this case, we do. Kels, let's turn back to me if we could. So, uh, in this case, let's just go with hands on hips. You are now an ath athlete. Let's go wide apart. You look like a, bob, a bobsleigh kind of team. Um, I don't know why. I just thought of it. Uh, can you move up to that way a fraction? There you go, bro. All right, let's just do it. So, centered between the two lights, we're gonna switch onto all. This means that the two background lights are the only ones that are gonna fire. And now you can see, oh, let's do that again because we had a hand on the way up to do the hair. One second. So we can see that we've got great separation. And if we're looking at the screen, you would see the kind of the edginess that we've got coming down the red on each side would be showing the muscle tone at this point. So then at this point you go, okay, well that's great. 
how do I now light the subject's face to get the dynamic look and feel that I want with it? So even though that's our two light kind of basic setup to begin, uh, begin with, that's the, the kind of the, the 10 and the two or the 11 and the one, okay? You're all kind of uh, mixed up with it. I would, for the likes of Kelsey as an athlete, you are now an athlete. Um, I'm gonna use the six o'clock position. I wanna put a grid on there. Do you know what happened to my grid? Thanks, man. Thanks, bud. So, let's put our grid on here. And this is a honeycomb grid, so it only really shows the light in a straight direction. So let's now take this up. It's a bit too high, Mark. There we go, let's shoot it. Same thing, okay, so we'll ignore the stand, uh, lower the chin, Kels. So ignore the stand in the way a minute, I'm just working on the kind of standard exposure. But you can see straight away how we're creating dynamic image, okay? So in other words, in the real photograph, of course, I would basically have this uh, stand out of shot. It would be handheld positioned here, or it would be on a boom stand or wherever it would be, so we wouldn't be seeing that stand in, in the actual photograph itself. That's the first kind of imagery to take it to that kind of the next level. Let's say you want to do a kind of a simple fashion two light set setup. So in that case, we're going to use our key light again. We're going to keep the grid on for now, just because it's going to pull the light a little bit more. And we're going to use a sandwich light technique. Um, so a sandwich, as you can tell, I like a few of them. Yeah, Brandon knows, our video guy, how much I like sandwiches. Sandwiches is a different discussion. Um, but a, salad, a sandwich usually has a great filling between two bits of bread, yeah? Uh, in other words, Kelsey is a great piece of filling today, and she does uh, look amazing. Um, but what I've got is two pieces of bread, two different light sources, so a top and a bottom of the bun, as it were, yeah? And I've got a strip box running, that is set at one stop less than this key, uh, the key light here. And then obviously we're, we're using this stand, the standard shot. Now, because we're using two lights, we can see the separation light is coming in from that 10, 11 o'clock position. I'm just going to move, uh, move it. I think when we were getting ready today, this just got touched a fraction. Now remember, if you're using gridded light, there is no forgiveness really. It only allows the light to travel in a straight direction. So um, this is going to give me the kind of the great se separation on the, uh, the body and everything else. You're an athlete, but you're still a beautiful woman. So let's turn your body away because I want to create a more three-dimensional bust. That's great. You're now Wonder Woman. Yes. <laughs> I love the first film. That's all I'll say. Okay, let's do it. So straight at me again. Let's keep the head in a vertical position because you are a strong woman. There you go. And we've got that two lights going off here, so we create that very dynamic kind of look. Now, even though I've created a very powerful stance, yeah, it's kind of that athlete, don't muck with me, I can still create a powerful female stance without having to do the, ob uh, the obvious, in other words, making them into males. But we don't need to do that at all. It's all about the kind of the mental adjustment, the shape of the face, but as a rule of thumb, I still, most of the time, want to actually show a woman with a three-dimensional bust to give her that edge of femininity, but still the strength of the woman. So it's kind of how we combine the light, the animation, and the pose, and actually the mental kind of look that she's going to be giving me to actually create that kind of look. So this is our sandwich light. We have the bread, we have the filling, and we have the bread on the other, uh, the other side. Let's, uh, so obviously, and that would work in exactly the same way, so in other words, if I move that one to here, D, 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 this is into our uh, five o'clock position. Let me just switch this one off. And because I've moved the position of the key light, uh, basically I'm gonna have to move Kelsey as well, but before we do that, no, let's move the body around. Let's move you back. So just turn the body towards there. Turn, turn to me a little bit, sorry, Danny. That strong f female fashion designer. Turn the uh, twist to me just a touch now. Just twist more, 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 more. There you go. Turn the head this way just a touch. 
that's great. Just there again, lower the chin, darling. Okay, so now we've got the sandwich technique in exactly the same way, but all we've done is kind of move the one light from the same to the other side. What I've created though is still that three-dimensional bust because I've turned the body away from the light, uh, the light source, okay? Uh, if, you're, if you're really looking to master your portrait photography or your commercial photography or your landscape photography, lighting is, light, is lighting. We're looking really to create depth and shadow and texture in everything that we're doing. We'll all have a slightly different take on um, what we like. That's a great thing because be uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder as such. And that includes taste and kind of style, uh, the styling through it. So don't just listen to guys like me that says, you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. You can do that if you've played around with it and you understand that you really love it and why you can love it. You don't even have to be telling me that, but as long as you've fallen in love with a certain style and look and feel, you do what you want. The main thing is take better photographs tomorrow than you did today. That's really all our ambition is. Okay, so if I want to show you the dynamic of why we turn the body away from the light, could you go back to the number one position where you're turning towards there and now pop the hands up here? Okay, so uh, remember, what we've done now is turn the body into the light source. And because we've turned the body into the light source, we've created a slightly flatter bust than what we create, uh, created before. So where possible, turn the, fe uh, the female figure away from the light source. That is absolutely key to actually development. Right, let's just switch this one off again. Coming to our end. Remember, get your questions to us uh, now and we'll try and answer those live, live for you. And uh, remember, come over and join us on the Photographer Cad Academy. Uh, we've got over 3,000 films available, uh, all advert free, of course. So we've been going for more than 12 years now with a, a whole variety of photographers who actually helped us create our content. Right, let's go back to that pose where we were kind of strong woman. I am going to turn, turn you, though, to this side. Okay, so that's it. Great. So um, I'm still working with the, light, uh, the lighting set at one stop below uh, than the actual working aperture, okay? So if we were working at f4, these would be set at 2.8, and that's what they're at. What I want you to really look at is the light from behind hitting the nose. It's an absolutely nose no, <laughs> all right? So you don't really want to bring exaggeration to the shape and size of my nose um, by allowing light to spill onto it. All you've got to do is move the light position or move the body position and move the head position to absolutely guarantee it. So that is about control, yeah? So all, all I've got to do is move that light in from the kind of the two o'clock position around more to the one o'clock position, bring it in from the side and just probably shadow it off just a touch. So let's try and do that same shot again and you will see it. Turn the head to me a little bit more, darling. There you go. Not quite as much. There you go, keep it. So remember, at this point, there is no light on the face, but we are really trying to control that light on the nose. Same pose for me. Let me just move that nose back again. So all you're gonna do is pay attention to the little things, otherwise they're gonna really kind of break you. Right, what else can we do before we finish? Let's look at hatchet lighting. So this, again, uh, absolutely brilliant for the likes of um, boxers, athletes again, people with power. I shoot a lot of chefs with hatchet light as well. Not, not because they're doing hatchet jobs on food, but I'm a butcher's son, so we know everything about hatchets. Um, so this is coming in from just behind the nine and just behind the three uh, position, okay? And so the hatchet light um, to begin with, let's go square on to me, please. That's great, okay. So let's do the first shot. And our lights, you can stay there for me with the feet if you could. You can see now why we call it hatchet is because if you look very close in on the image, you can see there is a black line running down the middle of the nose here. Okay, like you've almost split her in half and things really. And that black line will actually continue all the way down the body itself, okay? So um, it, it's not bad, it's, it's a powerful effect if you want to use it, but we'd usually add a complementary small little light source on the face to just take away that. It's really more for the body. Let's show you the difference though by just stepping through the light or back of the light. Could you just take one big step backwards for a minute? Okay, same shot, lighting in exactly the same position, 
but look now how the hatchet is still there but the line is now very very fine okay just coming through now if you are a photographer and you're looking to use a light on each side, think about why the light is being used on e each side. Just don't do it for the sake of it. Just don't do it because somebody else has done it. Understand why you are putting it there is one of the most important and fundamental elements of lighting in photography or in art or whatever it would be, is to make sure it suits the kind of the subject in front of you. Let's do the same thing. Kelsey, just walk one step to me. Whoa. So this is back to where we were. Lower the chin, very powerful woman. And then back up to me again, another full step. So now you'll see, as we walk through the hatchet, it gets to a point of just being backlight again. So once more, if we just step backwards on here, you can see the difference now from the hatchet light position where she is stood behind the kind of the gridded lights, then she walks back to the kind of the, Z, the zero point, in other words, just in front of them, a fraction in front of the three and in front of uh, the nine, as it were. And then we move her a full step forward and you can start, start to see now the light is not doing its job. It is actually spilling onto areas of the face and not doing what we're really trying to achieve. At this, at this point, step forward a little bit more for me. Now I just need to really turn it towards her. Same thing. And now we're, we're pretty much back to our... Dee dee dee. Our kind of separation light position. So now, if I bring my six o'clock light back in, switch it on, of course, tag on, that'll help as long as it's the same distance as it was before. We'll just give that a little bit more of a spot, focus light, directional. Lower the chin again, darling, keep it. We create quite a dynamic effect. So the main thing is one light to do one job, making sure that as we move the light around, around the scene, it is creating the type of photograph that we're trying to look at. The more controlled the light source, the more controlled the image. So just to finish off, of course, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, and then we can get a control of our light as we're going through it. As I encourage you, thanks, Kelsey. Very well done, darling. Thank you very much. Um, the main thing for us is to make sure we understand those positions of the light. Uh, sorry, uh, make sure that we understand the positions of the light um, and we set up how we're going to do it. As I said, I said to you before, my favourite pos uh, positions of light is either going to be at the 4 o'clock position or the 8 o'clock position. For more dynamic images where we're looking at uh, for athletes, chefs, business, etc. A little bit more dynamic, I'm looking closer to the 8 to nine or the three to four o'clock position, so between those paces. And if I'm shooting with athletes or where I need dynamic se separation, I'm using separation lights from behind and then actually using my light source on the front to be sympathetic to the style that I want to create. Hope you've enjoyed this kind of session live on the Clock and Compass. Remember, you can head over to the Academy. Uh, you can join us there. We've got five, thousands and thousands of films uh, for you to watch uh, in instantly uh, for 59 quid a year it's an amazing value i hope you actually get a chance to join us uh, brandon any questions for us live as we're going through there um, no no questions today thanks for joining us live uh, see you next wednesday at five when we're here back in the studio give you a heads up we're shooting in a blow-up swimming pool in my studio my studio I promise the model will be warm. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.